Let me welcome you uh, to this session on the world in 2014, rethinking the corporation. My name is Larry Summers, and my job is to serve as your moderator. You know, if you think about the history of the last 500 years, and you think about what institutions define that history, in many ways, the changing form of the business enterprise has been defining of the way the global economy functions, has been defining of power relationships between nations, and has been defining of the way in which a substantial fraction of the world's citizens live. That evolution in business organizations in the corporation, I think we can all agree, continues. And we have a panel of experts from very different uh, perspectives to talk um, about those changes. In just a few minutes, I will uh, introduce uh, my Harvard colleague, Mike Porter, who will kick off, who will, uh, kick off uh, the discussion. But let me just introduce Peter Brabeck Letmott, the Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Nestle's um, and a member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum. Mr. Nobuyuku Idei, the Chairman and uh, Group Chief Executive Officer of uh, Sony. Carly Fiorina, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Hewlett Packard uh, USA and uh, Gary Ryder, the Guy Ryder, excuse me, the General Secretary of the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions uh, in Brussels. To kick us off, uh, Mike Porter from the Harvard Business School is going to talk for a few minutes about the ways in which corporations and uh, the ways in which their environment have changed. Mike? Thank you, Larry. Well, this is a, an impossible topic, but uh, I think we'll all give it our best shot uh, because there's just so much to talk about. But in if kind of framing the topic, uh, I think uh, when we think about how corporations are and will evolve, uh, we need to have in our mind, you know, what are the forces, what are the drivers, uh, what are the changes in the environment of the corporation uh, that might underlie the need for corporations to uh, take on new forms and take on new roles and take on new structures. So I'd like first to talk about a few of those that seem uh, reasonably clear uh, and then try to uh, derive just a few preliminary implications of those drivers in really four areas of, of, of the corporation's uh, configuration. Uh, you know, first of all, its strategy, how are corporate strategies going to evolve potentially? Uh, second, uh, uh, how is the geography of the corporation uh, going to be evolving in terms of how it locates itself uh, around the world? Uh, number three, how is the structure and organization of the enterprise uh, likely to be evolving? Uh, and then finally, and this is I think a very interesting new uh, development, you know, how is the corporation's relationship with society going to be evolving? Because we see a tremendously uh, energize new debate and discussion and, and practice and, 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 and experience in that area. In terms of the driving forces, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, at least the big ones from my point of view are particularly uh, hard to see, uh, but obviously their pace, their direction, their specifics are, 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 are hard to uh, predict. Um, number one, I think we'll continue to see uh, uh, relentless internationalization of economic activity. Uh, it'll continue. Uh, any detours will be brief. Uh, this internationalization of economic activity is driven by economic necessity. It's an irresistible force. Uh, and it is leading to um, 
uh, a number of very interesting uh, 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 kind of reshufflings in, in terms of the world economic uh, landscape. Uh, number one, the overall demand uh, for many, many products and services is growing substantially as huge developing country markets grow rapidly. And uh, indeed, I think we'll see the center of mass of demand in the world uh, shift increasingly towards the developing world, where we have very large populations who are starting to get more prosperous. Uh, we're also starting to see uh, sort of the reverse activity of multinationals based in developing countries starting to take on significant roles in international markets. Uh, so I think that's one set of forces that we need to think about. Uh, uh, number two, uh, I think we see the relentless uh, uh, drive of technological progress. Uh, uh, I looked at the numbers recently, and global R&D spending is rising by about 5% per year, even during this difficult period in economic activity. So it's clear that the kind of technological intensity of, of, of corporate activity is, is going to continue to increase, and that is increasingly going to be uh, the game uh, that companies are, are playing. Um, uh, number three, I think we're all aware of a very profound demographic shift that's going to affect virtually all of the advanced economies in the world, uh, creating uh, labor shortages in those economies, and, and uh, which has many, many ripple effects. And uh, as a result of that and some of the other uh, forces, I think we're seeing a tremendous uh, scarcity of what you might call very sophisticated, highly trained uh, uh, workers or employees. Uh, and that, is, I think, is going to have very important implications for the corporation. Uh, there are many others, but, but, but in order to keep this brief, let, let us stop there in terms of driving forces. Our other panelists may want to add some additional ones. Uh, in terms of the implications for the corporation, from a strategy point of view, I think we've been through a 10 or 20 year phase of restructuring and operational improvement and process improvement and cost cutting uh, in companies, and I think we will see a shift uh, in some new directions, uh, in the direction of much more focus on strategic uh, distinctiveness and, and uniqueness as opposed to scale and size, uh, a, a kind of continued backing away from diversification. I think diversification is in retreat. Uh, in, in most companies and in most countries, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, necessity for innovation and the creation and protection of intellectual property. Um, and I believe we'll see a much more sophisticated discussion around uh, outsourcing. I think outsourcing is, is something that has been approached very simplistically in a, in, 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 in a short-term cost-cutting perspective. I think we'll see a much more nuanced a uh, set of choices about the balance between insourcing and outsourcing within the corporation. Uh, in terms of uh, geography, uh, there's, there's no doubt that there'll be an increasing geographic spread of the value chain uh, of companies. But I see, uh, at least in my own work, evidence that companies will kind of go deeper in fewer places and be more involved in, in the foreign locations in which they operate, rather than spread lots of, uh, of little locations uh, 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 everywhere. Um, in terms of structure and organization, I, there, I, there's some really profound changes, I think, that will occur here, principally around human resources. You know, we've kind of had a history of, 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 of the relationship of corporations with their employees that started out with sort of a lifetime employment model uh, in the West, and, and then, of course, Japan uh, uh, continued that. Uh, more recently, we've had sort of a free agent model. You know, people come and go as they please. Uh, uh, there's no real tie to the employee, but in, in, a, in an era of the labor scarcity and uh, scarcity of highly skilled employees, I think there's going to have to be a whole new uh, way of thinking about human resources. And these, uh, uh, how to attract and, and, and retain employees, make them committed to the corporation, get them excited about the corporation, I think is going to require a lot of new ways of, of motivating and increasing attention to values. Um, and making the corporation more of a community, uh, focusing more intensely on quality of life type issues. Uh, and, and so I think there's a whole set of human resource uh, agenda items that are, are going to be uh, profoundly important and different. Finally, uh, I think that uh, the whole relationship between the corporation and society has gotten much more complicated. Um, companies have a very complex set of constituencies now uh, to manage. Uh, they are very exposed from a public relations point of view to these constituencies. Uh, it's not just government, it's NGOs, it's consumer groups, it's all kinds of constituencies that are uh, seeking the corporation to behave more responsibly or differently. 
Um, at the same time, I think companies are starting to understand that that their, 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 their locations, their communities are increasingly important to their economic success. Uh, they need to have the right infrastructure, they need to have the right skill bases. Uh, and so I think that uh, this whole issue of corporations' uh, involvement in society is going to be a major focus of uh, thinking and practical uh, uh, developments in corporations. I think this will be approached much more strategically now. Uh, now most corporations approach it defensively. They give lots of little uh, donations to many hundreds of organizations. I think this is going to become much more strategic and much more integrated uh, with the overall business activities of the corporation. So uh, just to get the discussion started, Larry, I think those are at least some of the forces that uh, I would uh, suggest are at work and, and perhaps a few of the implications. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. Let me ask our um, three CEOs uh, on the panel as a way of uh, framing the way the world is now and the way they think the world will be uh, 10 years from now. You can think of your corporation as having uh, many assets. I've thought of five physical capital, human capital, intellectual property, your culture, your network of relationships. If you had to think about the real source of value in your corporation, which would you say are the most important of those assets today? And how do you think that pattern will change over the next decade? Anyone? Carla, you and I come from the same country. That, uh... <laughs> well, I, one of the reasons I think we're all um, hesitating over the question is um, I think the trends that will change and impact a company by 2014 are already evident. And I think one of those trends is clearly that physical assets are less and less important. Um, clearly, human capital intellectual property, culture, as you put it, and a network of relationships are becoming increasingly important. And I think that's happening now, and I think it will continue for the next 10 years. Um, we all have our mental models that we use to think about a company. And I have, um, I think about a company across three dimensions, which I think are in many ways very consistent with Michael's framework. I think about a company in terms of competitiveness, in terms of capability, and in terms of character. And I think that all three of those dimensions are changing. But in each case, it is the non-physical assets, other than people being physical beings, that are increasingly important. On, on the subject of competitiveness, I think first, companies have to internalize that the competitive bar is always rising and there must be a constant assessment of competitiveness and a constant investment in competitiveness. And investing in competitiveness is difficult because it requires usually tough choices. It requires investments that take a longer term point of view sometimes. But competitiveness increasingly will mean uh, drawing upon the talents of people all over the world and participating in markets all over the world. Competitiveness, I think, as well, means an ongoing investment with the long term in mind, not just the short term in mind, in innovation and training and education and development of people. Um, I think around the subject of capability, I believe the structure of corporations in order to maintain competitiveness is going to change fundamentally because of how technology has to be used to drive competitiveness. And what I mean by that is I believe we are entering an era where every process, every process, whether it's in the home or in the company, is going to become digital and mobile and virtual. Every physical process will be digital, mobile, and virtual. That has huge implications for the structure of a company. And I think fundamentally, companies will evolve from being vertically organized entities, vertically oriented around structures of command and control, 
Um, technology even has been organized vertically, and increasingly companies will become horizontal. To take advantage of the fact or to recognize the reality that physical processes will become digital and mobile and virtual. A horizontal organization is very different in its makeup. It certainly relies upon uh, a network of partnerships. It uh, very much derives its value from the connections between things, not the separations between things. And increasingly, value is driven by how processes work together, how partners work together, how employees work together, how suppliers and customers and employees work together. The value increasingly is in the connections between things. And thinking about horizontal processes is very different than thinking about vertical chains of command. And then I guess the final thing I would say around character, and again, I agree very much with Michael Porter, the, the character of a firm, which certainly is reflected in its culture, the character of a firm, how a firm does things is fundamental. It is not simply any longer a question of doing no harm. You know, it used to be companies would talk about our job is to make a profit and to do no harm. Now the floor of what is acceptable character is rising every day. It involves, at a minimum, honesty and transparency and accountability. But beyond that, I think the enlightened self-interest of a company, particularly a global company, enlightened self-interest requires us to do more than no harm. Enlightened self-interest requires us to do, this is HP language, we talk about doing well and doing good. And our ability to do good by engaging deeply in communities is enlightened self-interest because it creates markets of the future, employees of the future, customers of the future, and partners of the future. So I think across all those dimensions, competitiveness, which is a constant investment and requires a company to embrace change instead of resist change. Capability, which I think increasingly will come from viewing the company in horizontal terms, not vertical terms, and think about value being created in the connections between things, and character being a fundamental aspect of the value a company creates, and a fundamental belief that enlightened self-interest requires us to do good in the communities in which we live and work, not simply do no harm. Thank you. Peter. Well, now that in the good old European fashion, we have given privilege first to the ladies, you know, that's why we didn't speak up. We always thought the ladies first. That's, that's the way we were brought up. Um, I would like to say two words. First of all, I think whatever has been said, I fully fully understand. I think uh, the analysis was, was very exhaustive and uh, all this is fine. And yet, I personally wouldn't dare to forecast anything. If I look back 100 years, 1905, just while you went for 500 years, let me go for 100 years, 1905, that was an area of economic prosperity and expansion. If you had asked a group like us here that in 1915, because we're talking 10 years, we would be in the trenches of Verdun, killing each other in the most atrocious way. Nobody would have forecasted that. And those who were sitting in the trenches of Verdun never would have forecasted that 10 years later, they would all be dancing Charleston. You know? And you can go on. You go on from, from the 25 to 35, and you would not have forecasted. And you come to 85, and nobody would have forecasted that 10 years later, there would not be a sign of an iron curtain. So my thing is, I don't forecast anything because I don't think that the extrapolation of the past is good to forecast the future. Now that, of course, is not a very good answer. So what, what drives it? I think there are some facts which we don't have to forecast. And the most important fact is demography. That's we know. That's a very little thing we know. Uh, which, by the way, is very good for the food and beverage industry because we know that we have a growing population. We're going to have another two billion of new consumers, as we know. And the other thing we know is that we are growing older, all of us. Those are facts. Don't have to forecast. And from there onwards, I would say, for me, what is really shaping the future is the vision 
of the people who are managing the companies. And the vision is nothing else as a more realistic interpretation of a dream. If I would ask and engage today a CEO, I wouldn't ask him about restructuring, re-engineering and all this stuff, frankly speaking. I think this is everybody can do and if you cannot do it, you take a consultant, they do it for you, frankly speaking. I don't, I don't think that this is something a CEO of today should have been able. I would ask him about his dreams. What is he dreaming? What is he wanting to shape? Like you, are, you ask an artist, what do you want to create? Okay? And I think it is those dreams and visions of the CEOs which have to go through a reality check, of course, by the board of directors. And I think here is the importance of the board of directors to check that this is fine, which will really shape the next 10 years. What you have to have in an organization so that those dreams and visions are not hanging in the air, I think you have to have a very strong set of values and another very strong set of corporate principles so that you put a frame around it, a very strong frame around it. But within that, you have to be giving freedom and let them shape and create something new. So that's for me the most important factor that's going to shape the future. What the outcome is, I don't know. The other thing which seems to me is changing a little bit is time and time pacing. I think most of us basically are acting more driven by events. And I think in the future we will have to think more about the three dimensions of time. On the one hand, you constantly have to learn what the past has taught you, what, what, what you have been doing, rightly, wrongly, and you're in a learning process. At the same time, at the same time, you have to be fully concentrated to execute what is necessary today. And the necessary today is very time consuming because our world changes so fast so f that you have to be very, very fast in executing. And you have to get the third dimension into the timing, which means that you have to shape the future. I do not think that you can just react to the events that the future brings you. You have to shape the future. You have to participate in shaping the future. So this is the other dimension that they would have. The first one, the, the third one I would say is um, a balance. If I think what I'm doing every single day, I just trying to balance. Try to balance growth against short-term profitability. I think one of the biggest pitfalls of this shareholder value concept was that it was so short-term oriented. You know, it's so easy. It's so easy to create and maximize shareholder value. But to sustainable long-term profit and long-term shareholder value needs a lot of balance. You have to balance between protecting and extending your core business and at the same time, like it was said, you have to innovate, you have to renovate, you have to go into new things. Another balancing act. You have, to you have to balance what you're being pushed by many people talking about this global efficiency thing. Yes. But don't be driven only by global efficiency. But you might be losing a lot, a lot of local opportunities. Okay? Again, you have to balance this out. Information. I'm sure information is very important. But I bet you already today that we have much too much information that any single person can really use. Okay? So, yes, information is important, but don't lose the oversight. And sometimes it's better not to have too many information and keep your head out of the information and think about what you really want to do. And finally, it was mentioned very rightly, I think, this huge change from tangible to intangibles. A company like ours, and I know we are not the most exciting companies, you know, food and beverage. But I can tell you, my intangibles have increased eight times in the last five years, which I think confirms what you were saying before. So I think this balancing act takes me again, not so much to think about managing. I think the final job is going closer to art than it is to mathematical managing. I do not accept the saying, what you cannot measure, you cannot manage. I think in the future you will have to manage what you cannot measure. And this will demand a completely different dimension on the character and the characteristics of the CEO. So that's...
Mr. Rita? Well, uh, I'm sitting at the Peter Berwick's board as an outside board member. I'm always envy that the water that be never that mean downloaded. So that means, of course, for us erosion, but water not being downloaded by internet. But at our business, of the intellectual property, almost everything is downloaded and treated as a kind of free commodity, like music, the same thing, as broadband camps, probably picture. So I think uh, that 10 years ago, even the internet doesn't exist in the business world. Of course, in academia world, the internet exists. But look at 10 years of the evolution of the internet. It's a huge, I mean. So today, almost everybody uses internet. So the, I, it's very difficult to foresee 10 years after. So I'm concerned even the internet infrastructure itself for coming 10 years, how it will be. Because internet is not designed for or use such rich content communication. So, for example, in Japan, more than 80% of the, of the user of people get access to the internet through the mobile phone. So then, the, after the popular te television program in Tokyo finished, the people try to send the program to his father living in a, in a, in a, in, in Kyushu, for example, they send by internet from Tokyo. That, that makes traffic extremely busy. So I don't think today's architecture, today's internet, that won't I mean, I mean, survive next coming 10 years. So we need fundamental I mean, change. So that means who pay the investment of the future internet? So in the past, in the past 10 years, we experienced a bubble of IT. So therefore, a lot of company bankrupted, but yet basic infrastructure have been improved. But in 10 years, more people already experienced the bubble five years ago, so people become rational thinking. So don't over, over expectation of the IT bubble again. As a result, so what makes, I mean, the kind of how we can uh, invest next 10 years necessary architecture. So this is my, uh, I mean, I, I'm reasonably optimistic. I mean, I want to be a reasonable optimist for the future, but in this respect, I cannot be optimistic. So the next thing is uh, 10 years from now. Uh, I, I think there's a kind of continuous change and discontinuous discont change. So I, I think we need some kind of quantum leap that means jump. So what kind of jump? I mean, the cooperation. So again, I'm living in electronics uh, the field um, as a consumer electronic world. For example, a Dell computer announced the new I mean, business in television. So that's my business. Well, and California announced Shoe Television. Welcome to my field. <laughs> but, but, but in the past 10 years, Sony tried to go into the in, I mean, IT field. So that means uh, in uh, IT business and the consumer electronic business, there's no boundary. So there's no border. That means Microsoft are selling games. So in, in the future, Microsoft, I don't surprise, selling television. So Nokia, telephone company, was selling game. So well, that means it in industry borders. So everybody f finding the neighbor's uh, garden is more attractive. But actually, this is a difficult business that uh, Sony experienced. How going into the new business like, like uh, I mean, uh, information technology uh, from the home of entertainment, consumer electronics. So uh, anyway, but the brand, Sony uh, born in 1946, right after World War II in Japan. And the two prominent brands has been created in Japan. That means Honda and Sony after the World War II. The two companies became a global, I mean, brand company. So why have two companies been successful? 
probably globalization of excellence, through excellence of hardware. But in coming 10 years, probably electronics is only tool, becoming tool. So what kind of the brand, I mean, branding, what, what, is a, the, what is a brand in the future? So it could be totally different from today's brand in, in 10 years. So I cannot answer for what the cooperation will be 10 years, but what is sure is that we, like cooperation is like a human body, you can't control. One CEO and professional team cannot control your total whole body. Like you can't control the rhythm of your heart or blood pressure. Of course, you can control your left hand, right hand can move, but you can't control your body. So, the, in a sense, the cooperation becomes incontrollable. But then, I think the discipline or philosophy or what kind of dream that company has becoming more and more important. So Sony, was born, Sony is born 1946, when Japan ended the war, end of the war, the peacetime. So for Sony, the success of the cooperation of Sony coming 10 years, based on the peace of the world. Otherwise, we can't grow. So this is my first session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Guy, maybe I, want, I wonder if I could uh, put a question uh, to you uh, from a trade union uh, perspective. Um, a number of the comments uh, so far, particularly Mike and Carly, uh, suggested in different ways that they felt the corporations were currently relative to the past and would even more in the future be giving greater weight to stakeholders other than shareholders and that this would be a pressure they would feel and that they would feel it as part of enlightened uh, self-interest. A different view that one hears from the labor movement from time to time is that under the pressure of takeovers, increasingly impatient uh, shareholders, a more competitive global environment, the export of the apparently successful American model to Europe and uh, Japan, that in fact in the main um, shareholders are carrying a larger fraction of the weight in uh, corporate decisions with possible benefits for efficiency but some significant cost uh, for working people. I wonder if you might Give us your view on what the trend has been on the whole in recent years and how you see things evolving. Yeah, I, I wouldn't presume to go back 500 years or even 100 years well, to answer your question. Last decade. Perhaps 10 would do. Uh, it's, uh, I, mean, I think the performance of the last 10 years uh, indicates uh, that uh, companies have sought to. Um, project their values through voluntary measures, and I'm hearing the same thing again. Basically what we've seen has been companies uh, undertaking a corporate uh, social responsibility strategy, proclaiming values, claiming to pursue them. And they've been fairly successful in making this uh, a, uh, a way of claiming uh, a wider uh, sense of responsibility than that of simple shareholder value. At the same time, I think, companies have been quite successful in saying that so long as we're pursuing a corporate uh, social responsibility strategy, uh, the need for governance and for regulation questions to be taken seriously uh, is removed. Now, it's quite interesting to see that the corporate social responsibility boom of the last 10 years, they'd say, has coincided fairly closely with a significant collapse in public confidence in business. Uh, so I think the lesson of the last 10 years uh, is that unless there is some fairly substantial change in business attitudes and what society is ready to do about business behavior, then the perspectives for the next 10 years are probably not going to be very much better than those of the last 10 years. So I think in the first place, uh, what business needs, I, I, I think, to, to face up to is the fact that there is going to be renewed interest in questions of governance and of regulation, that CSR on its own does not do the job. Now, 
The governance question has been with us in a big way. It was here last year, it's here again with us this year. We were here, the trade union representatives last year, uh, saying that the list that began with Enron was going to be longer when we came back next year. So it has been. I don't think we were taken very seriously last year, and I get the feel this year uh, that business would like to say, well, this is a chapter that is closed, but it isn't. So rather than seeing corporate governance questions slip down the agenda, and the poll results show that it is slipping down the level of, of corporate preoccupations, we need to actually engage together in a, in a way which is actually going to address the governance issues seriously. The opportunity uh, is to hand. The OECD is undertaking a process of revision of, of corporate governance principles. That could make a change. That could actually bring some improvement. But what we're seeing at the moment is a danger that, in fact, uh, business and governments too uh, wish to actually uh, put this agenda aside rather than to grasp it. And the same is true in a wider regulatory perspective. It seems to me business has a major interest in actually engaging in putting in place, and it has to be globally, not just nationally, an appropriate framework of regulation of business activities. Now, I hear everybody here on the panel saying, well, values, values drive our corporations. Now, the problem is that neither society or, frankly, workforces can leave it to companies to define the values that should drive business behavior nor leave it to voluntary uh, action to have those values realized. It is for society and democratic process to set the values by which we expect business to behave and to adhere. This is obviously all the more important and it has to be addressed internationally in the global economy. What are we seeing today? We are seeing uh, companies relocating more and more frequently and we're seeing uh, the range of uh, delocation spreading from the traditional manufacturing to the new service sectors and this is raising a whole series of issues which have had quite a lot of airing here this week. What uh, is important I think to the trade union movement is not the fact of relocation. Trade unions are not anti-globalization, anti-corporate organizations. We understand that relocations are going to take place. But there are two issues around relocation. One is not so much the geography uh, in a spatial sense of relocation. It's a fact that relocations are going where workers' rights are simply denied or repressed. The preferred destination for business is a union-free country. And that's not a coincidence. Now, is it not proper, if you profess values by which you wish to, be, wish to live and be held, is it not better to regulate, to legislate these values in? And let's be very modest about it. Workers' rights very fundamental, fundamental set of workers' rights. I don't think there's a company on this panel, but I can be corrected, uh, that would not want to include in its value set respect for workers' rights. And I can believe that you're sincere in your statement. But are you not penalized if you do abide by those standards, by those other companies, if you leave it to purely voluntary behavior, which say, well, we're not going to be bound by that behavior, which actually make the business case for your values impossible to sustain. Do you not see the danger of being penalized for standing by your values by those that don't? Is there not the reality that bad behavior, bad business is going to drive out good unless you have some rules of the game to which we hold one and all? And it's not difficult to do. I think the second area, um, because I think the relationship between the company and society is very important. The relationship with the company and its workforce uh, has to be looked at as well. Now, reference has already been made to the importance of human capital, the necessity for companies to compete for uh, scarce and important skills. Uh, it seems clear to us, and experience shows it, that a company which actually uh, engages and makes a commitment to its workforce is going to win. Uh, win that battle of skill uh, uh, building and skill retention. Uh, I think that that relationship, that partnership, cannot be paternalistic. It has to be based on a, a respect for workers' rights, not for a partnership which is a dependent partnership, which we've seen far too often 
with fairly uh, dramatic and negative consequences. So the second area is, is social dialogue between companies and their workforce. From where I'm sitting, of course, that means recognition of trade unions, and that means bargaining with uh, trade unions uh, to set the terms of, of that type of partnership. So what it actually means is for companies to become less regulation adverse, more ready to embrace the issues of governance rather than to evade them, uh, more ready to uh, actually play a part in making regulation appropriate and not inappropriate. I think those companies that don't want to do that are simply fueling the anti-globalization, the anti-corporate sentiment uh, which is out there. And eventually they're actually going to place in some jeopardy the future of a sustainable, open global economy, which I hope we have a common interest in sustaining and safeguarding. Carly, let me ask ask you this, um, leaving aside the very important questions of what public policy should be and leaving aside the question of uh, motivations, I would have thought that in the United States the combination of much greater competitive pressure in product markets and much greater pressure from capital markets meant that uh, CEOs like yourself today, whatever their desires, had less room to invest in social, in various aspects of social responsibility, whether it was solidarity and whether it was relative equality in pay or direct investment uh, in communities or purely basic, or very basic scientific research, that they had significantly less room for that than they had one or two decades ago, and that as a more American approach came to Europe and Japan, there would be a, a similarly uh, greater pressure. Would, do you feel more able to invest at HP in various aspects of various things that one would associate with social responsibility than your predecessors a decade ago? Well, in fact, we have done more in the last three years, not less. Now, I, I can't speak for all companies, but uh, I think investing in um, education, investing in innovation and R&D, and investing in um, programs that do good in communities, those require a longer term view than a quarter or two. And despite all the pressures that CEOs feel, it is a CEO's job to think beyond a quarter or two. Uh, the issue of balance is absolutely right. Um, it is a CEO's job to balance the requirements of the short term and the long term. It is the CEO's job to balance the demands of shareholders against the requirements of employees, against the requirements and desires of communities, against the requirements and desires of customers. That's a CEO's job. It's not always easy, but it's not, it is not sufficient in my judgment for a CEO to say, I can't do this because of the short term pressures. Um, I also think, to your point about regulation and responding a bit uh, to uh, our colleague here, I do think companies have been, in some cases, short-sighted in saying that there is no role for regulation. Of course there is a role for regulation. Uh, companies have a huge impact, and therefore it is insufficient for a company to say, just trust us. On the other hand, I think it is equally insufficient for regulators to ignore the imperative of competitiveness. And uh, here, I think we are looking, in my judgment, what regulators ought to be focused on is what is an appropriate floor. We ought to be regulating the floor of what is minimally acceptable in terms of accountability, transparency, honesty. We ought not to be regulating the ceiling 
what is desirable. Because between that floor and ceiling, competitive advantage and competitive differentiation are created. And I think, in fact, uh, to the point of bad business drives out good business, in some ways, actually, we have seen precisely the opposite. Companies who have engaged in bad business, dishonest business, have been destroyed by the markets in relatively short order as people began to understand that the bad business was being done because, in many cases, people had lost sight of the requirement for balance, certainly between the short term and the long term. You had companies who were so focused on the short term they were willing to do anything. And you also had companies who had lost sight of the balance between what share owners were looking for, what employees required, what communities and partners and customers required. Um, I guess I think as well that, and here I would disagree a bit with, with my colleague, I think it is certainly the case that trade unions play a critically important role in raising awareness about what are workers' rights and helping to engage in the dialogue around workers' rights. I, I personally do not take it as a given that the only way to create an environment that respects and values employees is in a unionized environment. And I think um, in this case as well, every institution has to think about its competitiveness and the challenges of a different way of adding value. And I think this is the case for trade unions, as well as companies, as well as countries, as well as governments. Even universities. Uh, that as well. <laughs> Does, before, we turn, uh, before we turn to uh, the audience, do any of our other panelists want to make a very brief comment? Well, I only would like to make one comment. Uh, first of all, I think in a modern society which is characterized by the democracy, free market society, and civil society, I think it elevates this system that we have. I think it elevates the role of the private enterprise from a pure profit organization to a social relevant factor. I think this is something we have recognized. And I think in this sense, there's no doubt that it exposes the company to a broader response that we have. I think this is recognized, and I think in one way or the other, and I'm not saying that everything is perfect by no way. I spent two, day, two hours today with the Open Forum. And uh, of course, corporate social responsibility, as you can imagine from the NGOs, was very high on the, on the agenda. And I recognized what I just said, but I then challenged the other public, which was of course composed not of a public like here, who were saying that, of course, multinationals are basically the evil of the world. And I told them, I say, look, I will talk to you what I think about corporate social responsibility. My first priority with corporate social responsibility is to assure that I'm running a long-term, sustainable, profitable company. That's my first priority. Only if I do that will I start to think about the rest? And I mentioned, if I look into the cases you were mentioning uh, before, if I look at the Enron thing, if you go back, I went back, I looked at the so corporate social responsibility leaflets and, and talk of Enron, okay? Which was one of the leading companies in corporate social responsibility and celebrated. For me, the fact, that they have destroyed so much value for pension, for, 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 the, for the retirement cases, that there is no jobs left. This is the worst of corporate social responsibility. If you think today what is happening in Europe, you have hundreds of thousands of farmers who have not received the small money that they need to live every single day because the company went bankrupt. You know, you can talk to me about all the rest if you are not able, as a CEO, to assure the minimum, which is a long-term, profitable, sustainable business. That's our first corporate social responsibility. The rest comes afterwards. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think in the future, and we are in the processing of uh, combat changing from uh, labor-intensive manufacturing society to more capital-intensive society, where we need more investment for the, for the long-term investment. For example, semicond semiconductor industry, otherwise. So we need, I think, um, alliance with, or is important. 
uh, in order to, I mean, as Kari said, we need, the company become more and more horizontal. So we, Sony, for example, uh, made a joint venture agreement with the Ericsson, Beltesman, or the Samsung, and, um, well, IBM, for example. So these are the all future collaboration for, well, only one company. It's impossible to uh, make kind of infrastructure for the, for the many things. So the soft alliance become more important. Are there questions from the audience for any of our panel? Yes, sir. It seems the panel sort of have a commonality as, a, as agreement sort of say economy move from production heavy to the knowledge heavy economy, if you put it that way. What will be strategic, since we are talking 20, 2014, what will be CEO agenda look like? and 20, 2014, vis-a-vis -vis today, then can you identify one or two key changes in your agenda for spending your day time or month time? Can you hear that we can, so that we can crystallize in our mind what is the future coming in change of your strategic thinking in a fundamental way in your diary 12, 12 14 versus 2004? I think you already see the first changes now. You see, uh, 20 years ago, a CEO would not spend all the time up in Davos to discuss about corporate social responsibility, about political issues, about all of those things. He would be basically sitting in his office and trying to run his company. He would be very much inward looking. I think the CEO of 2014 as, as I mentioned before, the private enterprise becomes part of the, the society, will have to spend much more time, even more than what we do today, to be involved and integrated into the total society. There's no way out of this. Now we are, you will have to get accustomed to, uh, to tackle political issues, to sit around the table, which we are trying to do here to get a better understanding of the broader agenda and not just the agenda of your own company. And you will give this part, which I mentioned before, this re-engineering part and, 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 and this, this managing part, you will delegate this to lower levels and you will have to have much more time being spent on the broader agenda in order to situate your company within this modern society. That's the way I see it. I certainly agree. I, I'm probably not smart enough to tell you what my diary will look like in 2014. I don't even know what it looks like a month from now. But I do think that, um, I think increasingly there are two, um, two trends that I think are indisputable. One is what was just mentioned, the, the requirement to be more deeply integrated, and that requires more connection with the outside world. I think the other trend that's equally indisputable is a requirement to view a company in a very holistic way. A holistic way in terms of the connection, the interconnection of the company with the rest of the world, but also, frankly, a holistic way thinking about the whole system. I tend to think about a company system as um, strategy or purpose or goal. Structure